What the hell is this film? Seriously. I, I went into this expecting... I don't know. I don't know what I was expecting, but what I got was a bit of a mess, I must say. Now, I've done some reading up on the old internet, and apparently there is a three-hour cut, or there was originally a three-hour cut of this film. Um, but due to some studio pressure, I guess, uh, Don Coscarelli, who wrote and directed this, he got it down, well, he cut it in half, basically. He got it down to a 95-minute film or a 90-minute film. Um, I would really like to see that three-hour cut because I think it would probably explain an awful lot. This film feels very much like someone has had a ton of ideas about what would be a cool set piece in a horror film and then has somehow strung them together with some very loose threads uh, because it very rarely actually makes any kind of sense. The actor who plays the tall guy in this, you know, he's, he's, the, he's the Freddy Krueger, the Michael Myers of this franchise, is also not particularly great, I must say. I, I never truly felt menaced by this guy. And more often than not, I felt like he was kind of doing a pretty bad Roger Moore impersonation. Seriously, look at any of the posters for any of these movies, and that's pretty much the face he is pulling. That one eyebrow kind of slightly raised, and yeah, it's not really menacing. It's not really threatening. It's more comical. There are weird moments in there that never seem to be fully explained or even attempted to be explained. Like You've got these two fortune tellers and they make our main character, this, this kid called Mike, do this kind of hand in the box thing that, that appears from nowhere. And, and you're kind of sat there thinking, what's going on? And, and why are we just kind of rolling with this with no explanation whatsoever? By the time we get to the end of the film, I honestly don't know what's happened. Because uh, it's one of those kind of, it was all a dream moments, but it not all was a dream. It, so you're kind of left figuring out, well, actually, what part was a dream again? Um, and, you know, the characters I've thought had died haven't, and the ones that I didn't even realise had died have, and you're left scratching your head. There are some scenes that are really just outlandish and become funny as a result, like one scene when the, the Phantasm, the uh, Angus Scrim character, his finger gets chopped off and they have it trapped in this box. Uh, and, and Mike, this kid, he, he takes it to his, his older brother, Jody who opens it and they see it kind of waggling about inside the box and he just closes it again. And that, that bit's genuinely funny because I think it's meant to be. But later on the finger turns into this little whatever it is, this, this kind of beastie that ends up kind of flying around the house and they have hold of it and it's kind of dragging their hands all over the place. And it looks like a really kind of bad mime artist who doesn't quite know what he's doing. The central character of Mike is played by someone called Michael Baldwin. And he, he looks a little bit weird, I must say. You can't help the face you were born with, but he, he looks a little bit like a very young Jodie Foster, only a bit more effeminate. Um, and his character is, yeah, He's a bizarre one. He stalks his older brother. And again, I, I feel like if we had that three hour cut, we would probably have more there to give us a reason to, I don't know, identify more with this character as to why he does that. Apparently there's a fear there that his brother's gonna move away, but I never truly feel like it's expressed in the best possible way. Instead, we just get this kid who comes off as a little bit creepy. The little people, you know, they're, they're kind of creepy. There's a little moment where a few of them are chasing Mike uh, out of this, uh, out of the lair of the tall man, basically his base of operations. And they are a little bit creepy, you know, but again, it's, it's, it's that kind of fine line between creepy and funny. Sometimes they're quite funny. Also, much of the film's weirdness and the kind of lack of understanding as to what is going on is kind of almost 
one of its greatest strengths. Now, as much as I, as I have spent a lot of time deriding it because of that very reason, it's also quite fun trying to figure out what is going on. Um, I, I, I feel like this is one of those films you could watch on repeat viewings just to see if you understand it any better. Like there's one scene in particular when the tall man kind of, he's spotted by Mike, he's walking down the street and he kind of appears behind this other character, Reggie, and then he just freezes there and he has a little bit of a weird look on his face, a little bit of weird body language. And I kind of don't know what's going on. You know, I don't know why he's stood there, I don't know why he's doing that. And it's not until I read up on the internet that apparently he's having some kind of reaction to the cold. You know, Reggie is getting some stuff out of this freezer truck. So it's it's really cold. It's like icy air is coming out. And that is what he's reacting to. Now, I don't know if it's just down to the direction, the way it was shot, but I didn't pick up on that. Again, I, I, I think that there's, there's probably a lot in here that if, if you watch on repeat viewing, it, you might get rewarded from it. You might get something else out of it that you didn't get before. There's a really cracking um, set piece involving the sphere, you know, the famous sphere. If you've never seen this film, which I hadn't until this viewing, I think even if you hadn't seen it, you'd probably be aware of this sphere. You know, it's all over the posters. I think if you see any footage from this film, that tends to be the thing that gets shown. It's this weapon of choice by the tall man. And, and it's, I, I've never personally seen it in action. I just know that it flies through the air. It has, it has blades on it, so you can pretty much guess what's going to happen. Uh, but seeing it in action, seeing what it does, is actually still quite, yeah. It's quite bloody, it's quite brutal, it's quite violent, it's quite shocking. I'm going to give this a two and a half out of five. Uh, I don't think I can quite call it a good film, but it's definitely not a travesty, you know? Um, so yeah, straight down the middle, two and a half. But what about you? What do you think about Phantasm? And do you like any of the sequels better? Um, have I been too harsh? I don't know. Am I just not getting this film? Please comment below, let me know, and until next time, cracking.